saying welcome to this temple of wisdom, this oasis from the <laughs> sometimes crazy world that we find ourselves in, a place to think, a place to write, where you can do things like uh, join the Marcel Proust reading group, which just completed its first volume of, of uh, uh, what's the book called? Mem Remembrance of Things Past. And they're going to work their way through all the other volumes, uh, so you're welcome to join the Proust group. Um, we have things like that happening. We have uh, Cinema, Cinema Lit, which is a, a, a film festival that happens every Friday evening. Um, we ask each of you to think about becoming a member of Mechanics Institute. We're in good times right now. Our membership's at a 15-year high. We have exciting events happening every week, like this one with Jaron and Kim. Uh, next week, we have Joyce Carol Oates coming here, um, which we're really excited about. Um, before, uh, uh, well, let me move on to the introductions. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kim Mike Cutler and Jaron Lanier. Kim's uh, operating partner at Initialized Capital, which was a venture fund. And before that, she was a technology and financial journalist at the Wall Street Journal, at TechCrunch, and Bloomberg. Uh, she's worked on uh, uh, moderating events at Mechanics before. Last year she did a terrific event, and so we're really pleased to have her back. She's very thoughtful in her writing about the Bay Area and how we live with technology here. So some of you, I'm sure, have heard of Jaron Lanier as a person who coined the term or, or popularized the term virtual reality. You may have read on the back of this book Dave Eggers talking about the book as perhaps surprisingly for a book about the birth of virtual reality. This is a deeply human, highly personal, and beautifully told story. Uh, he recommends this book, among others. Um, you may have come across Jaron's writing in his previous two books, uh, Who Owns the Future or You Are Not a Gadget. Mm -hmm. Or you may have run across him when he won his Peace Prize at the German Book Trade, or maybe in the hallways of Microsoft where he's an interdisciplinary scientist. Or maybe you've seen him play one of his music compositions in Berkeley. Uh, tonight we may hear something from him as well. Well, I think Mechanics Institute is a good place for Jaron. Um, after all, he's a mechanic, and not just in the sense that he enjoys working with machines, but he's a mechanic in the sense that Walt Whitman imagined a mechanic. That is someone who's a maker. That is, what distinguishes us as humans is that we create. And Jaron's someone who's really exploring this in his writing and what he does, uh, just how we as humans make things and what that means for us and our future. So uh, I just wanted to say, Jaron, welcome home to Mechanics. We're really <laughs> pleased to have you here uh, amongst uh, your brethren. Um, I encourage you all to read. The Dawn of the New Everything, Encounters with Virtual Reality and Reality. And he pulls back uh, the curtains on a wonderful, sometimes scary and deeply human journey through life and the life we are creating, a journey that makes you wonder yourself about your own life. So, uh, Jaron, welcome again. Kim, thank you for coming, and uh, please join me in welcoming them. Can I make one quick Please. correction? I, um, I just changed my title. I'm no longer the uh, interdisciplinary scientist. I'm the Office of the Chief Technology Officer, Prime Unifying mm -hmm. Scientist, officially, which is Octopus. Octopus. So I'm now Microsoft's Octopus, which is, which is you know, the tentacles. But the <laughs> thing, just to be very clear, I, I do have a life there. When I'm out as a public intellectual, I speak, I speak strictly for myself. And, you will get no hints about Microsoft policy from this. This is very different from the Microsoft thing. So. All right. Okay. So um, I don't know if I've ever um, interviewed someone who's written their own, um, I, uh, you know, kind of autobiography. And I was just kind of curious to start off, like, in the process of writing this book and retracing your childhood and some of the early years in Silicon Valley, like, what were some of the biggest realizations you made about yourself in this process? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well... Um, I hadn't ever imagined I'd write uh, a memoir. Um, yeah. I think uh, a few things converged for me that 
Uh, we're very much about the, the cycle of life and death. My, my father passed away, and uh, then my wife was battling cancer. Um, and most, most of this book was actually written like overnight, waiting for results at UCSF mm -hmm. um, over in Mount Zion. So it was, it was very much trying to think about most basically like what's this all been about? What are we, you know, I was just trying to cut as deep as I could and try to get a sense of, of where we're at. Um, because uh, is the Silicon Valley mindset is a little bit more like building towers than trying to cut deep, and I, it just seemed like a moment to do that. So that that's kind of what I was going through. As far as whether I discovered things, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I think um, one of the things I try to explore in the book is just how unreliable memory is. Mm -hmm. And I found a couple of cases where I can prove my memory is wrong. And I, I like like what? Like what did you? Oh well, like th that's sort of silly, but. Um, like there's a point where I have a distinct memory of moving four people in my, I <laughs> got to tell these stories, I don't even know how to begin. <laughs> I, had, um, I, I grew up without a lot of money, let's say, and at, at one point I was really desperate for a job and I got a job being an assistant to uh, a midwife for indigent farm workers along the border. I grew up in southern New Mexico. And so one time we helped birth this baby, but because of legal circumstances we didn't want the dad was uh, arrested, the mom was institutionalized, we didn't want the baby to go into the system, so I ended up having this baby with me, and I was like, you know, bottle feeding this baby in the math department, and I was like, yeah, it was like just a bizarre situation. I was like 14 in this, ma in this math colloquium and with this baby. Anyway, so the dad gets out of jail and gives me a car, which was like this massive event in my life. Uh, in, like, the, without a car, having no car was like having no connectivity back then. You couldn't do anything. It was, and so I got this, uh, but the thing is, the car had been shot up when he was arrested for moving drugs across the border, so it was, <laughs> it was stuck in the Rio Grande. And the Rio Grande has <laughs> as much water as a bathtub most of the year along there, so I had to pull it out, and it had all these bullet holes. And, he, he looked, he said, oh, they're not so bad. He put like uh, bumper stickers over the bullet holes <laughs> and um, it had rotted out. So there wasn't a back seat. And I was also <laughs> making, I was making a living with a, a goat dairy business. I made cheese and milk. That was how, I, anyway, so I, <laughs> I would, I said, that's fine that there's no seat in the back and it's open. I'll just kind of make a platform to move goats around because I need that too. But then the thing is, after that, I have this distinct memory of four people riding in the car as if there were a back seat in that car. And the only reason I remember it is a stupid joke because it was uh, me and a, a weird hippie guy in the front and then two gay physicists in the back. And at, at, when you used to go into the border of Arizona, this, this very stern officer would stop you with the mm -hmm. mirror glasses like in a Hitchcock movie and he would say, any fruits or nuts? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing. But anyway, so that actually, I'm sure, I'm sure that that event happened and I'm sure there were four people but I can't construct how the people in the back could have been sitting on anything. Mm -hmm. and, and so I have no way to tie right. this together. Yeah. And so the thing is, that an autobiography is by necessity at least as much an act of invention as it is um, of discovery, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I'm certain that some of this is invention, but I can't really know exactly which is which. But I think what it is is it's, it's, it's a process of trying to just decide you are who you are once you've gone through enough of your life that it's really time to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what the process is really about. Um, I'm, so, you, like early on in the, the, the book, you talk about some of the thinkers or influencers like Stuart Brand and the whole Earth Catalog and Norb Wiener and cybernetics and like mm -hmm. some of the thinking that kind of married or fused to kind of the counterculture and the early underpinnings of the technology industry. And at that time, like, you know, personal computing was potentially viewed as a tool of personal liberation. And then, you know, here we are several decades later and you become more of a critic of the industry. And so I'm wondering how you take that narrative or what, what are the moments in time at which it turns from this liberating tool to yeah. this other system? Well, yeah, this is, I've been thinking a lot about that lately because I think one thing I didn't put in the book is the sense of regret I have because I, I, I was kind of in a position where I could have steered it a little bit more than I did at some crucial points like mm -hmm. in the early 90s and now I'm, I'm kind of regretting it but I, there was like this 
almost like this force field of shared belief among some of my friends. So it was, it was, it's really hard to buck up against that. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of wish I had been tougher about it. But um, the way I remember it, oh God. Um, <laughs> how long do you have? <laughs> we have only how long a few do minutes have? here. <laughs> oh my God. All right, so part of, um, so the, the, um, the idea of a digital network was first expressed to the best of my knowledge in a profoundly dystopian way that was completely prophetic and describes our present moment. And this was in 1907 by E.M. Forster in, do you guys know? The Machine Stops. The Machine Stops, right. The Machine uh, what? The Machine Stops. Uh -huh. How many of you have read The I Machine Stops? <laughs> All right, no. go read The Machine Stops, for God's sakes. So, <laughs> I mean, just do it. So, The Machine Stops was written, I think, in 07. I might, it's, that's close. I might have yeah, that off. Five okay. or seven. Yeah. Five or seven. So, it's a, it's a novella, a short novel, and uh, Ian Forster's the guy who wrote, like, all these sort of n novels that turned into kind of opulent Merchant Ivory movies like Room of the View. But he also wrote this thing, which was... Turn off the phone. Okay. <laughs> all right. No, it's all right. No, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, uh, and so, getting control of that thing is more for you than for me. Believe me, you'll be you'll be you'll be, <laughs> mm -hmm. you'll be happier the more you're in, in charge of it. Um, so, uh, he, uh, should I take all this time? This is going to be this whole thing. I mean, isn't this a? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I'm like, I'm personally interested in this okay, question because okay. I like so. <laughs> I'll do this as fast as I can. <laughs> There'd been a science fiction literature starting in the 19th century that was that was like um, utopian and everything will be these amazing flying cars and all that kind of stuff. And that was people like H.G. Wells. And then uh, uh, Forster was like, screw these people, I'm going to show what it'll really be like. And he did this really dystopian thing and everybody is... Uh, glued to their screens, they're worried about what other people think, they're worried about all this, this like sort of stupid abstract little like information quests that don't mean anything. They, they're, they're riddled with weird systemic bugs and nothing ever quite works, but they're really stuck in this thing. And uh, there are a few details, like they all have these uh, hexagonal screens, because there had been no screen. I mean, this was entirely invented, and uh, which suggests that they were a little like bees. Um, and in, in tech dystopian literature, you'll see bees come up. But anyway, at the end, the machine breaks, it stops. So the internet breaks down, and it's this horrible catastrophe, and all these people die. And I was like, wait, how did you let yourselves get so hook hooked up to this thing in the first place? And they crawl out of their cubicles, and they're and like, the sun, the sun. And so they, so it ends in this with this Rousseauian kind of a thing of like rediscovering nature, which I, I also don't think is quite the solution. But um, I mean, I love nature, but I think this idea of that opposition doesn't get us anywhere. But anyway, the, the machine stops is the prototype for all dystopian science fiction about information systems. It's the, the plot line is the same one that we did in Minority Report. It's the same one in the Matrix movies, um, and on and on and on. It's it's the er the er dystopia for information, and it's totally accurate. I mean, it's like he completely nailed it. It's exactly what happened. Um, so that was the start, and then the first practical, or sort of semi-practical. Utopian, who was actually building something, was Ted Nelson, who invented the first digital network architecture in the 60s at Harvard. And his thing was really different from what we have today. The number, number one idea for him was two-way links. There would always be attribution, and there would always be payment. It would be integrated with an economy. And that came out of his uh, parents being Hollywood people who survived through union activity that got people paid even when they weren't stars, which people died to get. It was like a huge victory for the labor movement. And then shortly after that, <laughs> that was in 1960 and into the 60s, things really changed. And so like in the early 80s, there was this very different feeling that came about, which was kind of like very anti-money. And uh, this was people like Richard Stallman, who's like, no, software has to be free. And I used to know him. And if you ever want to read about that, my, my isn't, first book. But isn't the irony that like, this is happening as it's like Reagan era 80s and then venture capital takes off in the early 1980s in the Bay Area. And so you definitely have money and you have open right. source. And it's like. Sorry, I was talking for so long. No, no, no. You, I'm, you I'm, should I'm, talk I'm, too. I'm interested in <laughs> it. I. Um, uh, Unlike Stephen Hawking, I don't have yeah. to calculate every word, so I yeah. will tend to go on and yeah. on. No, no, no. It's, I'll, it's I'll, bad. I'll, yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, what happened was 
Starting in the 80s, and especially in the early 90s when the web started, we had these dual ideologies that were not compatible with each other. So just as you were saying, so on the one hand, people loved like Steve Jobs, they loved um, the idea that the Silicon Valley entrepreneur could dent the universe and had this Nietzschean force of will to change reality. That was like this article of faith, and we loved, loved, loved it. But on the other hand, there was this incredible hippie thing. This was before the, this was before um, the uh, uh, libertarian wave. This was like, we hate capitalists, we hate money. So like, you, and how can you believe two weird things at once, like things that, that just don't Isn't connect? Isn't that the test of a first-rate intelligence? Or well, in this case, we flunked the test because there's precisely one formula that resolves the conflict, which is the advertising business model. Mm -hmm. So what happened is we decided that advertising would be the universal uh, business plan of the information mm -hmm. era, which meant that the whole society would become based on behavior modification and craziness and we'd enter the dark times we've entered into. Is there, are there a couple like key decision points in time? Like yeah, you know, absolutely. You go back in a time machine to like 1990, I can tell you whatever. exactly where we what? screwed up. Okay. Where, I mean, did we <laughs> where did we all screw up? <laughs> uh, Tim, so this is a little geeky. I, I don't know, I mean, this is the Bay Area, so it's probably okay to geek out, but I'm a little concerned that some people might be like, no, I was reading an autobiography, where are you getting, is it, do you mind if I, <laughs> you, you, all right. <laughs> I really like Tim Berners-Lee, but mm -hmm. he mega fucked up. So what happened was, <laughs> he, he said, this whole thing, this Ted Nelson idea that you have backlinks, everything's a two-way link, so you know where things come from and they're time stamped and all this stuff. Forget that. All you have to do is link to something one way, then you can use it and accumulate it, and there's no attribution, no time stamp, no, you, you never know where anything came from, nobody gets paid. Are you, you talking about traffic or what? what no, I'm talking about, about the linkage. Yeah. So in HTML, yeah. you just link to something and it doesn't know it's being linked to. Mm -hmm. All right. Now the thing is, you can't build a working web without the backlink. And so this brings us, so, so just the, the having only one way links, first of all, it's a lot easier because maintaining two-way links is this huge pain in the butt. Yeah. But a lot of stuff in computing is so what, you know. But anyway, it, would, it, it was I'm like I'm having a hard time visualizing. Like, what would a two-way link? What would that oh, experience of surfing the web look like? I'll that? tell you about it because okay. we rely on it now. Yeah. Let me get to the, this. Okay, will be yeah. this will be clear in a second. So that was that was that was episode one. One-way links um, on the web. That was the first mistake. The second mistake, um, and and. We complained about it a bit. Like, I remember when he presented the thing, and we're like, it only has one-way links. What's wrong with this? But everybody was, oh, let's just be lazy. For God's sakes, this will spread faster. It'll be what we'd call today more viral. It's easier. I should have screamed my head off. So should a lot of people. A lot of people feel regret for that moment. That was a mega fuck up right there. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't. This is streaming. I don't know what, I don't know what <laughs> my language should be. I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> violating. I feel like somewhere there's like a parent with their eight-year-old saying, oh, here's this computer scientist who will tell you about these things. I'm like, oh my God. So I'm sorry about that. I, yeah. um, this is how we talk though, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then the second thing that happened involved Al Gore. So what, um, he kind of did invent the internet, just to be clear about this. Okay. Um, he never claimed he did, but it's true. Not in the technical sense, but yeah. in the sense that there were all these different, nobody was ever gonna get together and have a unified global network. It wasn't gonna happen. And he basically got some government money thrown at it to try to get everybody to become interoperable. And that was the internet. Before that, there were packet switch networks. Was that when he was vice president? What, or what year was that? This was before he was vice president. He was a senator from Tennessee. Okay. And yeah. the Gore bill was, um, Funded by this by the by the United States to bribe people into becoming interoperable because mm -hmm. otherwise they just weren't gonna get weren't going to get their act together and that was the internet. Mm -hmm. Gore did that. He did it like. But the thing is, <laughs> there's this question: What is the minimum requirement to have something you're going to call an internet? Like for instance, does it have memberships? Is there some representation of people? There has to be representation of the computers. You have to have numbers that talk about the computers because mm -hmm. otherwise it won't work. But do you does it know about people? Does, is there any information storage for people in it at all? Does it have any um, persistence of memory? Can you, do you provide that? Um, do you provide a linking system? Mm -hmm. And we made, and by we, I mean all of us, everybody in the loop did this thing that I really regret. And I, I remember having a feeling like, I, like you know how sometimes 
you're going along with something and everybody seems to want it. You're like, okay. But then you realize like in the pit of your stomach, wait a second, this is stupid. But yeah, okay, we'll go. We'll drink that stuff, you know. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, and then the next morning you're like, what was I thinking? So I had that one of those feelings about this. So what we did is we said, we don't, we're not into big government. So we're gonna leave we're gonna do only the absolute most minimal thing to have an internet and then all of the necessary functions that everybody can foresee that will also have to be universal will leave to industry, will mm -hmm. leave to entrepreneurs. So what we did is we set up a requirement to create new giant data monopolies and monopsonies. We, we prac at that moment we created Google and Facebook even though they didn't exist yet. At that moment we said, okay, they're gonna be these giant commercial monopolies for basic functions. So two-way links, if you send a message to somebody on mm -hmm. Facebook, they know who sent it. Yep. Two-way link. Mm -hmm. Google had to, well, let's talk about Google first. <laughs> because we didn't have two-way links, the whole thing was this giant, mysterious um, furball like me. Like, you couldn't tell anything <laughs> about what was going on. So Google had to crawl over the whole thing and build up, a after the fact, the two-way links that mm -hmm. we didn't build in. So they made billions of dollars to make up for this missing thing. Similarly, we didn't represent people. Facebook makes billions of dollars from adding that. Ev all the giant monopolies that make tons so of what money. Kind of, what, what kind of entity would have, in an alternate parallel universe, you know, to the one that yeah. we're now, I mean, what, what does the provider of that look like? Is it in the government? Is it a consortium? Is it like a? Yeah, I think we should have, uh, and I want to I want to be very clear, this thing would not have been perfect, but I think we should have created some entity uh, just like we had, we were forced to create entities for just things like domain names, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just, there should have been an entity that did the two-way links and did personal representation and, and just did all the basic functions. And those yep. entities could have been semi-public with private consortium members. I don't know what it would have been. Yep. I'm sure it would have been, there would have been some corruption in it and some imperfection and we'd be complaining about it now, but <laughs> but not as bad. I mean, I think it would have been better and we really screwed that one up. And I could go on and on about other mistakes we made, but those are those are the two of the really big ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so throughout the book, you also talk about um, the history of virtual reality and you have these 52 definitions of the book of what VR is. Um, and this is some of the ones that I liked. I, I think that like uh, one definition that you said was like virtual reality is um, a medium that could convey dreaming. Um, you also said, uh, you know, it's the technology of noticing experience itself. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how you came up with those? Oh, just in talks like this over yeah. the years, just thinking of things to say. Mm -hmm. um, on. Um, the experience one is, is very core to me because um, uh, we're very used to technologies that kind of subtly give the message that you're the same as a machine, um, mm -hmm. that everything's just mechanism in the world. So for instance, if you talk to your speaker <laughs> and you're, you're talking to Alexa or Cortana or Siri or something, it's sort of like there's this equivalence, like you're becoming a little like a machine in order to be understood because the stuff isn't that good and it's becoming a little like a person. You sort of think, oh, isn't it cute? It's like another person. But it also kind of degrade, um, degrades you in a way as you're elevating it or, you know, or mm -hmm. the two things are inseparable and impossible to tease apart. Um, virtual reality to me has the opposite effect. Like you're in virtual reality and if it's, a, if it's an interesting good system, which a lot of them still aren't, but the good ones, you can not only change everything about the outer environment, but you can change yourself. You can you can turn into a huge spider or something. You can change your body plan. Mm -hmm. You can change the logic of how the world works. And there's a very interesting thing about that. You're changing all this stuff about circumstance. Your brain is experiencing this altered world that it's acting in as if it's real, but there's something constant there. There's this little angelic point, and that's you that mm -hmm. remains in the core of it while everything else changes. And that's you. That's this mysterious consciousness thing that we kind of pretend doesn't exist. But there's like something there. You feel it in VR. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the state of the field, you know, 2018? Of like VR? How, yeah, how far it's progressed, or it's uh, not progressing, or what, where, where is it for you? Or how do, you do you feel? Uh, <laughs> I have kind of mixed feelings about it. And I, I have to be careful here, because this is, 
I'm totally in the middle of the commercial side of it right now, so I can't speak as an outsider or as an, uh, a disinterested third party. Yeah. I can't, you know, so. Um, and I'm sure I'm totally biased about a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I feel the, um, there are a few things that the VR industry is doing wrong mm -hmm. that we've already done experiments with and we know how to do better. Like such as? Um, one thing is we're trying to sell VR content as if it were game console content, which is as this big chunk of this developed thing that was expensive to develop that mm -hmm. we want people to pay a fair amount for. And VR has a different rhythm to it. Like you can sit on the couch and space out and sit there kind of with your controller for 40 hours on whatever game it is. With VR, you, you can't do it for a long time. You get tired. It's a very different thing. And um, what the one experiment that I'm aware of that, that has created a monster amount of interesting content very quickly was Second Life, which mm -hmm. I was also involved with. And any Second Life people here? Mm -hmm. All right. So <laughs> uh, work at it or use it? Uh, use it. All right, cool. So the thing about Second Life that was interesting is it has a very fine-grained commercial layer, which means that somebody can sell just nothing but a texture mm -hmm. and somebody else can incorporate it, but it doesn't, the, the contributions of people who just do, do simple things aren't forgotten. They still make a little bit of money from something that's a, a conglomeration that is then sold, mm -hmm. which was Ted Nelson's original idea in 1960. And so what that did is it's, it, it sort of instantly created like this giant Burning Man-like thing. Mm -hmm. or, and in fact, Burning Man, to a degree, was influenced by it and became a Second Life-like thing. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of grew up aesthetically together. And um, uh, so I feel like we're doing these coarse-grained stores when we should be doing fine-grained stores. Mm -hmm. And the big players, there are little players doing mm -hmm. fine-grained, but the big players are all committed to coarse-grained, which doesn't work. And we have not seen great results in any of the VR stores. There are a few, there are a few bright points, but it's not great overall. How, how do you feel Facebook is doing as a steward of Oculus? Any Oculus people here? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, do you work there? Oh, no. No, no, yeah. oh, no, no, buy them. I mean, yeah. buy VR, spend all your money on VR, please. <laughs> uh, do it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no, I, once again, I'm, I'm a little, I'm in a little bit of a spot here because I, in that particular thing, I do Microsoft stuff. On the other hand, we have a lot of overlap with them, and uh, I worked on the the Minecraft for, for Oculus, for instance, which is which is cool. And um, uh, I think I think they have a lot to learn about a commercial model that'll really reach people and scale. Yeah, and, yeah. I um, would say from our, it's been hard to invest in because everyone's just waiting for the distribution to exist. For applications to, to then to have um, developers. Yeah. See, people don't remember the way we got to the market for game consoles that we have yeah. now is we started off with these really simple 8 bit things that yep. people could write just as individuals. That's what I used to do in the early 80s. And we can't, like, you can't say, okay, you have to have this giant team and make a decision to invest in this huge thing and we'll put it on the store and people will spend all this money on it. You can't bootstrap bootstrap an entirely new medium like that. You have to have, now I'm, I'm criticizing Facebook that way. It's not like we're doing any better. We're doing yeah. the same thing. And uh, so, um, and there are some bright spots, but just overall, I think most people would think that the Oculus store and the Steam store and so forth would have a little bit more happening by now. Mm -hmm. um, and people just need really simple stuff to get their feet wet. Look at um, uh, Pokemon Go is a mm -hmm. great example. Yep. Super simple. Uh, controlled level of investment just gives people something they can do at their own pace and it, it like that 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 level is the right thing for right now mm -hmm. yeah um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about I mean so you first I think your first place you moved in the Bay Area was like Santa Cruz was that correct or yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah what year was that 80 80 yeah yeah tell, tell me about um, the Silicon Valley of uh, the early 1980s, because you've got a lot of really interesting stories in there of different figures and people from yeah. that period. Well, it was, um, one thing about it is it was kind of scummy and, and disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it really was, like you'd drive down El Camino in Menlo Park and there'd be like strip clubs and winos and it was like not, it was not a fancy place yet. There were little pockets, mm -hmm. but, it was it was kind of a scummy place, mm -hmm. and um, 
uh, we didn't feel like we ran the world. Like um, the, the feeling in the hacker world was more like we're these insurgents, we don't know if we'll get anywhere. There's this implacable giant called IBM and uh, it, was, it was very, um, uh, <laughs> it's very nascent. And uh, you know what's funny is um, the HBO show Silicon Valley yeah. um, shows a culture from the Silicon Valley of the 80s, even though it's supposedly current, but yeah. th just the characters in it are actually a little bit more true to the older Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there from that period that, it, I mean, it sounds, you know, it sounds familiar from this. I mean, I, I grew up in the Bay Area in the 1980s. I grew up in Silicon Valley in the 1980s. Um, but, like, you you know, like, LSD gatherings, like, uh, sex part, like, the, all that stuff, which is, like, there's still, that culture is still. It's different now, though. Yeah. It's really different now because the element now is this sort of extreme sense of elitism and power. Yep. and. There used to be people who were kind of elite and powerful, oh, like S Steve Jobs or something, but there wasn't this general, th th that was sort of like the weird thing. It's like, oh, that guy wears weird hats and this guy is like weirdly elitely powerful. It was just like a few people had this weird attribute, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like this universal paradigm. And so like if you, this, the old culture of weird parties and stuff seems to have turned it, like there's even some elite thing about keeping chickens now. And it's I, don't like, it's I, like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's real. I that story. I was like, kind of like, <laughs> people carry kept chickens here for like decades. Like, people have been homesteading here for for de years, and so. But the, 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 yeah. but the thing about it that's different is this idea of like the elite chicken. The elite chicken. <laughs> like, yeah. That, the status chicken, and that's where things get really <laughs> stupid. And I don't th that we did. We might have had chickens in the old days. I'm not saying, but we did not have status chickens. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's like the loopy culture, but then more income inequality, more wealth inequality, but like put together, right? Or I don't know. Yeah, it's like some. It's like what we have now is like this cross between um, Woodstock and Wall Street, or something. You know, it's like this yeah. very strange. Like it's 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 this version of a, what used to be an alternative culture mixed with this super stressed out, status oriented. We're, we're going to own the world kind of culture, and that that's different. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there was also other stuff that was in the book, like mm -hmm. the, um, I didn't, I mean, I, uh, you, you mentioned that like rent a mom, there was a rent a mom trope <laughs> yes. in the early 1980s. <laughs> That's true. And I was like, people, I mean, that, that feels like a lot of the startups of the last, I don't know, five years too. But like, Doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But it like, I, I was like, didn't realize that that was also going, that, or that you perceive that as also going on like 30 years ago. Like, yeah. Well, there was this weird way that back then we were trying to live in the future. Like people would walk around with little like uh, notebooks uh, in like little cases on their belt and stuff to simulate what it would be like to have a device someday that, that you could carry around. And we tried to sort of simulate the future. And one of the things, there was this weird myth going around that I never found any truth to, but maybe it did exist, that there was this thing called Rent-A-Mom where you could, you know, like you're this hapless hacker mm -hmm. who can't deal with anything and you rent this person who would come and be your mom and listen to your problems and help you with dressing and laundry and stuff. And everybody was like, we need to find Rent-A-Mom. I really need Rent-A-Mom. <laughs> and it did actually, a lot of the, the gig economy is kind of Rent-A-Mom in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, yeah, at the same time you also talk about, there's like, you talked about like the, there's a lot of, uh, to references to women, like throughout the book, um, you know, from the very beginning, with you losing your mom mm -hmm. as a child, to then ending up in the Bay Area in the '80s, and then the, the rent a mom startup, and then, but also then you also mentioned that there was also, you know, a small number of unofficial but super social, super powered women that actually yeah. connected all these companies we, together, but were never talked about in the, in the yeah, they're media. missing they're missing from the histories. We call them the grand networking females uh -huh. and. They were, um, and uh, some of them are still around, and I can I can tell you some of their names. Uh, Coco Khan was one, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Linda Stone was another, mm -hmm. and Linda Jacobson was another, and uh, Margaret Minsky, Marvin's daughter, was another. Mm -hmm. And these were people who um, just connected people and created companies and introduced people, and then hoped to get some kind of a consulting gig, and often didn't. But a lot of Silicon Valley was invented by these people. I mean, an extraordinary number. My company, the VR, the first VR company wouldn't have ex existed without them, but I can also tell you about so many others. 
um, that specifically came about through them, uh, including Google, but I can't tell the story in detail, but they were, um, and I feel like a lot of what happened with social networking was in a way a subconscious attempt to finally usurp the grand networking females. Mm -hmm. like, we, like the guys will finally have their own network now. <laughs> but that's mm -hmm. kind of how it felt at the time. Uh, maybe even earlier with MySpace or something. But yeah, there, w there was this role and um, um, it's, uh, um, there's something terribly sad that it, it's not properly recorded. I tried to capture a little bit of it yeah. in the book, but I don't know enough to really get yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, like as someone who grew up in it, it's like very familiar like narrative, which is you work at these companies and then like there are men who are in the magazine covers, but there's a lot of women who are basically making the or whole. Marie Spengler was another one, yeah. she's huge. Like she had an enormous influence. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, boy. So those are those are some of the names of people who should be as famous as somebody like Jobs, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Can you talk a little bit about? So I want to talk a little bit about like. There is a little bit of reference of like, someone who was involved in VR and like how mm -hmm. gamer culture evolved and like the same way that you pointed out these couple of significant moments in like the design of the internet. Like, are there particular moments in, you know. Um, like gamer culture and the evolution of like troll culture that right. were significant. Yeah, and so this is another complex issue. Um, the, I'll try to, just to say the, the most important things as briefly as possible. Um, I'm convinced by extensive research that gaming in itself doesn't bring out the worst in yeah. people, but forums for gamers do. <laughs> which are two different things, um, separable but currently not separated. Mm -hmm. The forums problem came to everybody as a shock going way back. When I first got into it, we had a few sort of early forms of social networking where mm -hmm. you could sort of post things and other people could post things like Usenet. Some of you might remember that. It's still around. Um, and we discovered this amazing thing, once again with apology to the poor parent who's ha who has her eight-year-old tuning into this, but like you'd suddenly feel like this, almost like this demonic force inside you and you turn into an asshole and get into some weird flame, like be you become sadistic towards some random mm -hmm. person. And uh, it was a new phenomenon because it just came up so quickly and so shockingly. And uh, I think I understand it. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a theory about it, but which what, I, what's your theory? Oh, um, okay. My, the theory I have is that um, people have um, a uh, I call it the the uh, the, the the lone pack switch. Mm -hmm. So there's some species that can function either in social structures or by themselves, and the most famous in our popular culture is the wolf. So mm -hmm. you can have a lone wolf or you can have wolves in a pack. And they behave differently. And mm -hmm. so there are a few things that are really different. One is that if you're in a pack, your relationship with other members becomes more important than your relationship to nature. You have mm -hmm. to pay attention to the politics and the power structure even more than to where like the water is or where the prey is. It's, like a, it's a weird thing. The, the s social cognition overwhelms individual cognition, whereas the lone wolf really has to perceive nature, has to, mm -hmm. has to and it's a, it's a different way of being. So I think people are like that. I think we have the switch. And uh, in order for civilization to survive, we have to keep the switch in the lone setting as much as possible mm -hmm. for many reasons. And this becomes this whole long story, but everybody has to be an individual in order for a market to make sense because otherwise it just becomes tainted and turns into a, a failed market. And same thing for elections and a democracy mm -hmm. for everything. People have to be individuals, but also just to be decent or to be scientists or artists, you have to perceive the world as it is, not the social structure to perceive uh, that climate change is real. You have to look outside of your immediate social structure at reality, and, and you can't when it's in the pack setting. The pack setting has its place, um, and, I, and I think there are appropriate places for it, but I think what happens is when you're in a setting with other people on one of these abstract forums of, of any design, you tend to go into pack setting because mm -hmm. you're no longer dealing with the real world directly. You're dealing with this purely social thing. And I think the antidote to it is to have some real world stake that you're working towards that's something other than a global competition for popularity or mind games. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, as, and once again, I might be biased because of the Microsoft thing, but of, of the big social networks, the one with the fewest assholes is LinkedIn mm -hmm. by 
by all accounts and all measures, so far as I can tell. Why? Because the people on there are worried about their careers. They have yep. something real other than the mind games with each other to worry about. So I think the solution to the asshole problem is to have anything real that people can pay attention to, some connection to reality outside of the abstraction of that little social thing. As long as there's an alternative, most people will choose it and you won't have this extreme um, horror that comes out. Um, so, I, like, I've been, you know, in one of your more recent ta talks, you've raised this concern, which I, I share, um, you know, which is like this clamoring for these companies to, to do something about kind of like hate speech or hate language mm -hmm. or troll, like, but at the same time, you know, you are relying on a single, like, unaccountable corporate entity to make unilaterally make a decision over what, you know, speech is allowed versus is not allowed in a, De like a democratic society. I mean, what is the, what in your mind is the right way of threading that, that mm. needle? Especially because they don't seem to want to give up transparency or control or, you know. Well, um, yet another complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the yeah. internet is hard, man. <laughs> I know. Well, look, um, uh, the people, no matter what weird alphabet companies there are, we're not going to make death obsolete soon. And mm -hmm. so the people who currently are in charge will die and new people will take their place. And what we've seen from history is that when there's a center of power established, it's typically inherited by people who are less um, sympathetic than the original people. Mm -hmm. So you might start with Bolsheviks, who you might not like, but they're better than Stalinists, mm -hmm. right? And so the thing is, the natural course of events is that the power centers created by companies like Google and Facebook will be inherited by some equivalent of digital. So the thing is, uh, the, the way to create a legacy is not to consolidate power, but exactly the opposite. Because otherwise your legacy will in fact be determined by horrible people who will seize it. Mm -hmm. So until you grasp that, you cannot create a positive legacy and you will not be thought of well. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the message I've been trying to get across. Now, as far as specifically what do you do, I, I do have some thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, the, the, the basic thing I think we need to do is change the business plan. Because uh, what's because of that problem I mentioned where advertising was the only solution for being uh, capitalistic and socialist at the same time, uh, everything's free except with advertising. The only, um, that creates an entire system based on manipulation. And mm -hmm. what started as advertising turns into continuous behavior modification of a very high order because um, the- Enable Skinner box. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, in fact, I mean, one of the sad things is that uh, Skinner boxism is essentially the practically universal application of machine learning at this mm -hmm. point. There mm -hmm. are exceptions, you know, to understand scientific data, but they're, they're almost token, mm -hmm. you know, and so, uh, if we want to get out of this incredibly stupid mess where everything's about manipulation and lying and the whole world's getting dark and crazy, we have to change the business plan by which we get basic things. So there's a really obvious way to do it. Start paying for Facebook and getting paid by Facebook when you make something that's valuable on it. Like you have to remonetize it. So how, how would you create the catalytic movement that then compels Facebook to offer, even offer a paid lane because like it doesn't seem like they would just do that on their own because that would too be too <coughs> profound a structural change for them to yeah. undertake. I, my feeling is that the change has to come from a bunch of directions at once and I feel stakeholders to realize that they've kind of screwed themselves over because this business model doesn't allow them to diversify. They can diversify cost centers but not profit centers because mm -hmm. everything has to be consumed into this data grabbing for manipulation. So no matter how many alphabet companies you make, you're still 90% manipulation and spying. It's really stupid. Like, y you need to consolidate if you're a big company to be robust, you mm -hmm. know, and, to ha and so the, uh, the, uh, the companies that don't rely on this stuff, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, mm -hmm. are diversified. The ones that do can't diversify. And so, so that's the corporate argument. Then there's the legal argument, which um, in the event the EU has any headspace at all after all its crises, they really get it and they'll push it. Then there's just the, the plain sense economics argument. The math mm -hmm. works out better. Um, I'm convinced Facebook will make more money under this regime, and they should. They'll deserve it. They'll yeah. earn it. And I could go on. And then also yeah. just people have to get this. They have to realize how stupid the system is, that, that what's called a free service is not free when it's destroying your world. Mm -hmm. And um, I think more and more people are getting it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so last uh, last question before mm -hmm. we go to music. Um, yeah. So one thing that's surprising in here, I mean, like you've got a lot of um, like key stories about pretty um, you know iconic countercultural figures like Timothy Leary, and then um, also I mean, like, and then there's this kind of hilarious story about Richard Feynman in the book. Yeah. Um, but you yourself have never partaken of marijuana or LSD or any like. No, I never have. Yeah. I've just had the intuition it's not for me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very proud of that. I've, I've never had alcohol or marijuana, and I've never had a social media account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not that I'm judging anyone else, but <laughs> um, I would say keep the alcohol and marijuana, marijuana <laughs> ditch the social media account. <laughs> he says over Facebook Live, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, I do, was wondering if, do we have time for questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah, he's, you, should, you should tell the Feynman okay, story. I think we were going to do music and then questions. And I'm, don't worry, the music is going to be good and it'll be short. So you don't, you don't have to worry. I know like, oh my God, the music, what hope? But <laughs> no, it'll be all right. But, um, oh, well, which Feynman story? The, uh, the uh, hot tub and Big Sur. Oh, the hot tub one, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, so <laughs> I have this other weird life of uh, talking to physicists about computation stuff, and I'd known Feynman from when I was little for a lot. It's a whole, that's a whole other story. But anyway, um, uh, towards the end of his life, he was diagnosed with cancer, and um, he had a huge tumor taken out of a leg, and he knew his um, time was limited, um, and... Uh, he had this, he'd never tried LSD, and he had this idea that he wanted to try it. And he had this particular vision of being with a bunch of hippie girls at hot tubs above the pounding waves of Big Sur on a cliff. Was Esalen or? It or wasn't Esalen, no. Was not? There were oh, actually okay. other places. Yeah. This, these weren't natural springs, they were okay. hot tubs. But the, yeah, Big Sur has all kinds of weird hippie stuff in it. Yeah. Uh, or at least it did. So um, this, this, this came about, and then he's thinking, I don't want to fall off the cliff. I need somebody I can trust who won't take LSD. Oh, oh, that that weird virtual reality guy, Jaron, he'll do it. So he asked me to be a spotter to keep him from falling off. <laughs> the cliff. So I'm there, like, kind of like, okay, he's not on the cliff. And so there's like Feynman with a bunch of of, um, of uh, hippie w women, um, and he had a really good time. It was really fun talking to him when he was on LSD. He was a uh, um, when he lost math, he was like really delighted. Like, wow, the machine doesn't work anymore. Like he, we were trying to do some math and he couldn't do it. But he was like, he had this kind of delight in watching that process. Because basically, generally, he could always do math, you know. So <laughs> this was like a really completely novel experience for him. And um, he was just a super sweet, super generous, amazing guy, a good drummer too. Um, and obviously, rather stunningly had his act together in physics and, and, and also in teaching physics, like just an um, amazing, amazing figure. I was actually thinking about him today because of Stephen Hawking mm -hmm. passing. And, um, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, two people who were sort of more generous with young young um, students who came along than I could, like, I, I find that I don't have it in me to be quite as generous with young people as I want to be because I just, like, I, I kind of, lose attention, I just have too many other things to worry about, but Feynman man, and also Hawking, they, they always had that time. They never, they never, uh, they never got bored mm -hmm. dealing with insufferable young people like me, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> pretty impressive, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you wanna, do you wanna play music? Oh you wanna yeah, hear yeah. play music? So I, I, I was just playing with this this morning, and I thought, in, in a way it's supposed to be a little of a, I, a lot of times if I bring music out to something like this, I try to do something that's kind of upbeat and rhythmic, but I'm going to do something a little um, more kind of um, slow, partially in memory for Stephen Hawking, I think. Oh, this is a vertical bass flute, um, and then this is a foot-powered shruti box.
we have time for a few questions now. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <laughs> from your social You're media account? A little screen. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious, are there particular decentralized web technologies that you're particularly excited about that could perhaps fix some of the problems of the current web, such as, you know, the Ethereum platform, blockchain, uh, Solid, you know, by Tim Berners-Lee, um, or any others mm. that you're aware of? Well, you know more about blockchain than I do, I'm sure, because you're actually working. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I think there's an interesting, there's interesting potential there, but I don't, you know, like, I, I still think governance, like, one of the biggest problems is governance and trying to figure out how to properly govern a system like that and who should have stakeholder, like, who should have voice and how these systems evolve, right? And so, like, you know, with Ethereum and Bitcoin, you have two kind of divergent um, systems of, of of, of governance that produces different outcomes. For example, in, in, in Bitcoin, a lot of uh, like attention within the developer ecosystem is centered on the core protocol, where, whereas in Ethereum, it's more on the applications above the core protocol layer. And then there are new tokens that are coming out after that that have even other different governance mechanisms. But I think they're all very interesting. Um, but I like I'm also like having been here for a long, not that I don't know, like, like having lived here for most of their life, I just have always just a, 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 a wariness. Um, I think that, you know, with every wave, like, I mean, technology, th th these are tools that essentially amplify human nature, right? And so anything like good potential is always mirrored by potential for abuse. And so it's not like, a, we'll, we'll, you know, once a new thing takes off, it will bring a whole host of consequences with it that we can't possibly fathom right now. I don't know, but. Well, I, so I, I'm interested in economics as I, because I'm interested in changing the economics. And so as a result of that, I've spent a lot of time with economists. And the hot topic has been blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Everybody's interested in it. So I have looked into it a bit. And the first thing that strikes me is every time I look into a particular blockchain, it's formally structured as a Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. And then the next question is, why? Like, um, are investors really that stupid everywhere? And the history of markets would indicate that the answer is yes. You know? <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is though that in the past, you could have Ponzi schemes that weren't really fully Ponzi schemes. Something would happen, like, the, like a tulip craze actually would improve technology for tulips and cultivation. Like it well, would actually the be thing something that the, the example the that I need is like, like people bring up tulip mania in the Netherlands, but what people don't realize around, like, Literally around the same time, um, tulip mania reflected a period in Dutch history in which, like, Amsterdam created the world's first working like stock exchange, and the Dutch, Dutch East Indies Company was like one of the very first companies to ever raise capital in an equity-based format by sh selling shares. And so you had this like mania that also paralleled the development of like basic financial infrastructure that is now ubiquitous and commonplace throughout the modern world. But the thing is. So, so in my view, the tulip craze doesn't deserve quite the degree of disparagement that it usually gets. And mm -hmm. the same thing's probably too, true for the dot-com boom, perhaps, um, from the turn of the century. I'm not sure about that one, but the thing is, um, we have to ask, what is this blockchain and cryptocurrency craze leaving us? What's it developing? And the problem with it is that it's, like, there has to be one of them, at least it's not a Ponzi scheme left standing. There, you know, and it There's can look like a Ponzi scheme to motivate people, but it has to somehow at the end of the day not be one in order for us to create something out of this craze that we can use later. Yeah, I mean, I think there's interesting, like, um, you know, we recently participated in, um, we're looking at a decentralized exchange that's based on the Xerox protocol, uh -huh. and so you can actually trade cryptocurrency assets without ever handing over custody to them to a centralized entity, which then, you know, makes them, obviously there's like security advantages for that. And, and, and you know, like centralized exchanges generally get ha have often been hacked. Um, and so like, that's, a, that's an interesting, like, like mm. ex an exchange as, as a first entry point towards other it's types of things. The tulip, the tulip craze was a craze as far as tulips, but the money itself could be regulated. It allowed there to be Keynesians in the future so that you could have some kind of fiscal policy and you could make the money itself not the tulip craze. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing. That's, we haven't achieved that with cryptocurrencies. The thing is, 
is in its core the money itself is the tulip, and that and that's the, the, the and, and also we have to talk about the um, the green problem with it that using computational inefficiency as a governing principle. Yeah. So that's what, yeah. That, that was the, the, the yeah proof of work versus other uh, other uh, proof of stake versus other systems that don't require the same level of energy. The same level. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like we should put the servers on the moon. That's what I've been thinking. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think anyway. Yeah. We're going to have a whole program on currency and Bitcoin in the future, so uh -huh. save yeah. the questions for yeah. them. New question here. It's a very intriguing talk. Thank you. A uh, question is, if you were the CEO of one of these mega companies, how would you, uh, which company would you be the CEO of, and how would you modify their business plan, and what effect would this have on our current way of life? Thank you. Um, okay, I'll leave off Satya. Um, that's the Microsoft, his, his <laughs> <laughs> the Microsoft CEO, who I think is, is cool, actually. Um, and so I would, let's see, I could just go through them. Facebook, so easy. Um, we're going to start, um, you're going to start uh, paying on a sliding scale. If you're genuinely destitute, you still get it free. Otherwise, you start paying. We're going to call it peak internet. When people started paying for TV with Netflix and HBO, TV got really good, and we call it peak TV. We're going to do the same thing with the internet. We're going to tell people, you're going to start paying for peak internet. What peak internet means is two things. One is we guarantee that you're not going to be manipulated. You're not going to be see stuff that's downstream from Russian bots or some bullshit. <laughs> and we also are going to pay you when your posts are valuable, when you do things that other people use. Um, and we think a significant number of you are going to make a living from this, and this is a better, more dignified option than basic income. And we're going to grow and become a more diversified company, too. So I'd make this transition to a monetized Facebook. I'd do it globally. Um, I would gradually shut down the business, the uh, advertising business, and commit to no advertising revenue after 15 years or something, mm -hmm. and declare it to be something that was an experiment that turns out to destroy civilization and should be banned, and ask the world governments to ban it so that no competitor comes along, make a deal with each country saying, we'll stop doing it if you don't let anybody else do it. And the EU would, would, would love it. I do something similar with Google and search, but especially with Google and YouTube. Um, and um, Twitter, do this to Twitter, it suddenly will make money consistently. It'll, it'll like be great for Twitter. They'll be so much happier over there. Um, and that's it right there, yeah, right, that's the direction. And uh, um, yeah, and uh, so, and I'd also, um, I'd start a equity and, pri and, uh, equity and profit sharing model with Uber drivers and other gig economy people. And I'd have them all buying into uh, a long-term fund that will create retirements for them in the event that their country doesn't do it. And I'd make all the companies more profitable and richer as a result. <laughs> uh, we're, all, we're all talking about decentralization and all that, so I figured I would say something. But is there an, like another way to make uh, money on, on the decentralized web, you know, like hosting your own private internet and your in your neighborhood or something like that, you know, dig new wires. And Maybe um, behavior modification and addiction are the only ideas that have ever been proposed and certainly the only ones tested. That doesn't prove that there aren't others, but there's nothing else on the table that I've ever heard proposed or expressed that's even slightly credible. There might be. I mean, I can't prove it doesn't mm -hmm. exist. It just hasn't ever been articulated. And people have been trying for many years. <coughs> to amplify it, to amplify a point you made, uh, Warren Buffett said that if you're going to invest in a business, invest in a business any idiot could run because sooner or later an idiot will run it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> is it possible to create a way of running business or government that won't be corrupted by power uh, and won't be or, – or, or incompetence? It won't succumb to incompetence in time. Um, well, you know – People haven't been on this earth for that long, and people with any degree of technology base worth talking about have really not been around that long. And we have a very, very limited experimental base to work with to understand what might work. Uh, there has never been a democracy that's lasted particularly long. There have been some, there have been some republics that lasted longer than we have. Uh, there's, to my knowledge, there's never been a multicultural democracy that's lasted. Um, for very long. Um, so we're, we're in giant experiment territory. The key is to survive long enough to get experimental results and to keep on trying different things until we know more. 
So I think the key right now is to have a diversity of attempts and we've instead been codifying the whole world around this stupid model, um, which we can already see isn't working, which has got to be the worst thing possible. Um, I think the answer will have something to do with uh, a little bit about what's worked at least somewhat in the US of a balance of power and multiple layers of structure that balance each other. Um, and um, I think having alternate forms of entertainment so that the government isn't itself the source of entertainment is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I, uh, I think we, we really have a lot to learn. I'm very much an empiricist on this. I mean, I w I when I've answered that question, something like that in the past, like I, I've done conversations with lots of tech workers who are interested in civic engagement. And I generally, you know, how people say, you know, a truism is that marriage is work or a truism is that your co-founder relationship is like a marriage and it takes work. But also I always stress that like people's relationship to civic society is also like a marriage and takes work. And if you disinvest in it, not just in a financial sense, like not paying taxes or something like that, if you disinvest in it from an attention and energy perspective, your systems and public institutions will decay. And like what is happening right now is the continuation of 30 or 40 years of like really broad based cultural civic disinvestment and on public institutions in this country, so. First, a, a real quick observation. Both you and Bill Gates came out of New Mexico. Did you know that, that Bill Gates? I don't think he grew up there. I he think didn't he, grow up there. He had Microsoft in Albuquerque yeah. for a little while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's just a quick observation. And I think Feynman did. Wasn't he at Los Alamos at some point? As a kid, he was briefly at Los Alamos right. during the heyday of the Manhattan Project. <laughs> but uh, what I really wanted to ask you was to go back to the original comment here, which is about being makers. <coughs> you are not making anything. Show me what you're making with your hands. There was a very interesting book review a couple of weeks ago, the Times Book Review, about this whole issue of disconnection from <coughs> the machine and, and the human being in terms of making things, weaving, for instance. And, and I, I'm sorry, I'm coming off a cold here. Um, don't you think this has some repercussions somewhere in our, in our lives? Well, uh, personally, I've made a lot of stuff, and I still am, but that's, I'll, I'll let that slide. Uh, but. Um, yeah, I think working with physicality is great. I, I, I think it's especially, uh, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I, and I think the idea that computation, doing computation without the physical side makes you misunderstand computation. I would like, um, when I had students um, in virtual reality, I made them grind their own lenses and build, build headsets themselves. Because I, I really believe this off the shelf thing and all you're doing is twiddling bits does not teach you anything. It just puts you in a rut. So I mean, I, I agree with you. I've just built more than you think. <laughs> question here. We'll take two, two more questions. <coughs> um, I have a question of a completely different kind. Um, partly because I'm technologically challenged. Uh, I have a flip phone. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, as you, you've written an autobiography or a memoir. It was called both of those things at the beginning of our discussion. And I wondered if there were models of uh, autobiography or memoir that you had found particularly compelling that were of use to you in uh, writing this book. Oh my God. Uh, well, there's a lot that I have found really moving. Um, it's hard to know exactly where to start. Um, Nabokov speak memory. Um, Edgar's story about his his family um, is amazing. Um, uh, well, remembrance of things past was I went through a whole thing with that when I was a kid. Uh, and um, uh, I. Uh, I don't know, there's a lot. I think it's a cool genre. I like Keith Richards' thing, which is mostly just spoken and transcribed. I thought that was really cool. Um, I liked, um, uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. 
it's like I always have a hard time with this kind of question. People say, "Oh, can you recommend five books?" And I'm like, I just feel like my brain seizes up because mm -hmm. I just have no idea how to even begin to talk about it. I just like don't even have the slightest clue. <laughs> question here. You want to? Or I don't know. Hi, I have a simple question. Uh, so you defined VR as, uh, or one of the ways to define VR as consciousness uh, of experience, but it's primarily situated through a human's consciousness. And so my question is, is there a VR experience out there that would allow for a different kind of consciousness? And if not, is there capability of developing something like that? So you mentioned earlier the spider. So could I experience the spider's consciousness through VR someday, or now for that matter? Well, we have to be careful here. Um, ultimately, we have to remember that VR is a medium. It's, an, it's, a, it's a flow of artifacts created by people. And so uh, I think it's possible for a painting or a book or a piece of music or a VR creation to potentially expand our sense of how things might be and, and have more of a feeling for what it might be like to be a spider. But it's important to remember that we're not, we can't do that in a technical sense because we don't have any consciousness meter we can stick into the spider. So we can't, there's a, there's a, it's a very important distinction to make. Um, one of my favorite little tropes from the origins of computing was garbage in, garbage out, that you can't create meaningful data out of nothing. So. For, for something which is fundamentally mysterious, we cannot sort of conjure answers. We, we can do art and culture with VR, but we cannot do some kind of magical, technological um, transfer of experience to you from a place that we can't even measure it. And it's, it, it's a subtle distinction, but it's absolutely the most important thing to get about VR. This will be our last question. Um, this idea that um, Advertising or the ad-driven model of, of supporting the internet is this perverse solution to the problem of capitalism and socialism. Do you write about that anywhere or have other talks that are recorded somewhere? I'm really intrigued by this and uh, I don't know that it's in this Yeah, book. so I, yes, quite a few. Um, uh, I've written about it since the early 90s. There's a whole bunch of essays uh, about it from way back, but the best known examples are a book called You're Not a Gadget. Um, <clears throat> an alternate economy is foreseen around this, which is in a book called Who Owns the Future, which is from five or six years ago. There's a little bit on it in this book. The next book has a bit more on it. The next book is gonna be called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. <laughs> um, in which case you'll have to find a different video streaming solution for these talks. And um, uh, the um, uh, if you're, if, you, the, if you're into the uh, nerdy economics of it, um, there's a paper in this year's Big Econ Conference on it that's called Data as Labor that you can mm, look yeah, up. Yeah, that's a really good paper. Yeah, and then uh, there's also, there was also a cover story in The Economist about it, and there was a, a piece about it in The New York Times last week. Uh, so the, the, the sort of uh, academic economic side of it is kind of purring along and learning more and more, and it's, it's um, non-trivial. Um, and um, uh, I... Uh, there's a few other talks. Um, uh, I don't know. I never watch my talks online. Um, I'm I'm doing a TED talk this year, and they they really make you do a good video. They're very um, brutal about it. So that one will probably be well produced and stuff. Um, I usually don't even try for that. But uh, so <laughs> those are so. But you might want to look up the data as labor um, article. It's very easy to find. Um, cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, you'll be here afterwards. Sign books. Much and, thanks and thank to Darren so Lanyer really and Kim Bay Cutler for our inspiring talk. If you want to find the book, M The Machine Stops, or is it The Machine Ends? Machine Stops? Machine Stops, yeah. You can find it in our library on the second <laughs> floor, so come on down, pick it up and read it. Also, join us again for Joyce... Carol Oates, on Wednesday, March 21st at 6.30. Thank you for joining us. Can I tell a Joyce Carol Oates story? Yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's this thing in Berkeley where the Berkeley Library, uh, now Berkeley's going to be issuing its own cryptocurrency, but they used to have this thing where... 
I, I'd love to hear that. But anyway, we, we, we would do like these fundraisers with local writers at the Berkeley Library, but they would become so raucous that they got to the point where they wouldn't let the writers talk themselves. So they'd have a third person speak for the writers. I was, at, with, I was with her at this thing, and they would have each of us stand up in turn, and then this other person would just read what they think we would have said, and then they force you to stand down, and you weren't allowed to talk at all. And I was just thinking to myself, oh my God, thank God Breitbart isn't here. Like, <laughs> this would be like such a thing. Anyway, that's my story. Come buy a book. <laughs>